to turn back to John 14, uh, Jennifer Myers, Greg and Trish Elmquist's daughter, is going to have surgery in the morning. Uh, she's had this cancer ever since her daughter was born, and uh, they request that we pray for her. Uh, it's going to be in the morning. And I want to remind everybody about the get-together at Doug and Faith's for Christmas. They're going to have valet parking because it, uh, Will and somebody else is going to do that. So looking forward to that. Let's pray for Jennifer. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that you would be pleased to, if it can please you, to cause her to be well for your glory and the good of your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I've entitled this message, Judas, not Iscariot's question. Now, I think it's interesting how it says in verse 22, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. He wants to make sure this is not we know this is not Judas Iscariot speaking. <clears throat> this same man is called Labius, who is surnamed Thaddeus in Matthew's account, just Thaddeus in Luke's account, Judas, the brother of James, in the Acts account, which would make him the brother of James the Less. And uh, what a name, James the Less. I'm looking forward to trying to bring a message on that. Don't have any idea what I'm going to say yet, but that's coming next week. James the Less, that's all we know about him, is he's James the Less. And the names Labius and Thaddeus, both of those names mean large-hearted. What a description of this man. Large-hearted, not narrow-hearted, but large-hearted. Hearted. That's what I want to be. That's what I know you want to be. Large hearted. Some have thought that he is the author of the book of Jude, but we can't be certain. But here we have the only record of anything that he had to say. And what a question he asks. Look in verse 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord. How is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Now the first thing that comes to my attention is we have a great fact stated. The Lord Jesus Christ manifests himself to a certain demographic under the term us. You manifest yourself to us. And the Lord Jesus Christ does not manifest himself to this demographic called the world. Look in John chapter 17 for just a moment, verse 9. Now this is something that is so clear from the scriptures, yet religion seems to altogether overlook it. Look in verse 9. The Lord says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. That's strong language, isn't it? I pray not for the world. Whoever the world is, I'm not praying for them. I'm not representing them. Here's who I'm praying for. But for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. The word world or cosmos is used in John's gospel 58 times. And it has various meanings, none of which mean all men without exception to ever live. Not one time does the world, the word world mean that. It can mean the planet Earth, or the universe, or the inhabitants of the Earth, 
the ungodly, Gentiles as contrasted to Jews, the world were forbidden to love. Do you remember when John said in 1 John chapter 2, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world? For all that's of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. Now this is a world that we are forbidden to love. Now let me give you some scriptures how this word is used in the book of John. John 1.10, he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, the world was already condemned. He didn't have to send his Son to condemn the world, but he sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. <clears throat> John 3, 18, this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John chapter 7, verse 7, the Lord says to his brethren, his kin, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. John 13, 1, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. He speaks in John chapter 14, verse 17 of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive. No unbeliever is able to receive God the Holy Spirit. He can't do it. Then we read in John 14, 27, My peace, my peace, I give you, not as the world giveth. The world has a peace to give, but it's a false peace. It's not real. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. John 15, 18, the Lord says to his disciples, If the world hate you, you know it hated me before it hated you. He said, If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. John 16, 37, in the world you shall have tribulation. That's promise. And then in John chapter 17, verse 14, he says to his father in this great intercessory prayer for his people, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Because, and listen to this, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If you're a believer, you are no more of this world than the Lord Jesus Christ himself is of this world. That's amazing, isn't it? That speaks of the eternal union and existence we have with the Son before the world was, before the foundation of the world. In John chapter 17, verse 25, he says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known thee that thou hast sent me. John 1836, he said, my kingdom is not 
of this world. Now simply stated, how is it that thou will manifest thyself to us and not to the world? Simply stated, clearly stated, the us is the elect of God. The world is everybody else. And that's clear enough, isn't it? The Lord puts it that way. The us is the elect of God. The world is everybody else. The Lord said, I repeat, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me. The us is everybody who knows God. The world is everybody who does not know God. Paul put it like this in Romans eleven seven: 7, the elect and the rest. The elect hath obtained it, the rest were blinded. The elect and the rest. Somebody says that's too simplistic. No, it's just what the scripture teaches. Very clearly, very powerfully, very succinctly. The us that he manifests himself to is the same us as Romans 8, 31 and 32. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall I not with him also freely give us all things? The world is every unbeliever. The world is everybody he refused to pray for. Now, someone may think, well, why didn't he save the whole world? You have to take that up with him, but I know it's best. Whatever he does is best. I, amen. Whatever he does is best. I don't need to understand it, but I believe whatever he does is best. It seemed good in his sight. And instead of getting upset about something like that, because if I get some upset about something like that, I am saying that I deserve for Christ to come and save me. That's what I'm saying about that. I'm saying there's some merit, there's some goodness in me that makes God owe me salvation. I don't want to say anything like that. I don't want to take that posture. I want to say, Lord, make yourself known to me. Don't leave me to myself. Make yourself known to me. Now, Judas, not a scared, asks this question. How is it that you will make yourself known that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Now, the Lord had evidently made it clear that that's what he's going to do. That's why Judas asked this question. But how is it? That's a good question. I want to know the answer to that because I want to know if I'm one of the people he's manifested himself to. That's my motive in wanting to understand this. How is it? that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world. Now, the only way I can know God is if he manifests himself to me. The only way I can know the Lord Jesus Christ is if he reveals himself to me. Judas understood that. I think particularly of when the Lord said to his disciples, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they began to say, well, they say pretty good things about you. Some say you're Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. Actually, those things were derogatory toward him, but they thought they were good things. He said, but whom say ye that I am? Peter answered, thou art the Christ. God's prophet. God's priest. God's king. Thou art the son of the living God. You know how the Lord answered him? Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonas. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Now listen to me. If you believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, it's because God himself has revealed himself to you. Don't overcomplicate that. Don't try to think, well, is, is it that simple? Yeah. Yeah, it is. If you believe the gospel, if you believe he's the Christ, the son of the living God, 
I'm not asking if you believe you're elect or if you believe you're regenerate or if you believe Christ died for you. What do you believe concerning him? Do you believe that he is the Christ, the Son, the eternal Son of the living God? Then God made this known to you. Now, Judas, not Iscariot, says, how is it that you manifest yourself to us? and not to the world. Now, it would not be wrong to say that this answer that he gives Judas continues till chapter 16, verse 16, because it's one continuous statement up until that point. And then somebody asks him something else. What is this that he saith a little while in verse 17? And you shall see me, and again a little while you shall see me no more, because I go to the Father. I've you could say that this answer was not ended until then, but we don't have enough time to uh, cover everything he said tonight. So we're just going to look at what he said in the immediate context of chapter 14. So, <coughs> verse 22, <coughs> Judah saith unto him, not Iscariot, not the traitor, Lord, you know, that's not what Judas called him. He called him master, teacher. You remember when the Lord said, one of you shall betray me? And 11 of them said, Lord, is it I? One of them said, master, teacher, is what that means. Teacher, is it I? This is not that fellow. This is the one who knew him as Lord. Lord. How is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me. If a man love me. Now this is something that can be said of every child of God. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves everything about Him. He loves every one of His attributes. He loves His holiness. He loves His sovereignty. Aren't you glad that He controls everything? He loves his justice, that he saves in a way that honors the justice of God. We love his grace. We love his love. We love his mercy. We love his power. We love his wisdom. We love his humility. We love everything about him. And we know why we love him, don't we? We love him because we're such loving people. <laughs> Not at all. We love him because he first loved us. We know that. We know the love that we have was not produced from these evil hearts, but it's the gift of God when he gave us a heart to love him. That's where that love comes from. It didn't come from us, but we love him. We love him. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Maranatha. Let him be damned upon the Lord's return. Now, was Paul being harsh there? No, that's what ought to happen to somebody who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Now, here's how this love is manifested. If a man love me, he will keep my words. Now, we love him. We love to think of him. Aren't you thankful when the Lord gives you grace to think high thoughts of the Lord Jesus Christ when you see him as glorious and beautiful? We love to hear him exalted. We love to hear him honored. We love his presence. We love his word. We love to have communion with Him. And this love is seen in keeping His words. 
You can't separate Jesus Christ and his words. Somebody says, I love Christ. Well, you do love his words. I can tell if you really love him by if you love what he said. That's how he is known, his words. If a man love me, he will keep my words. Turn back to John chapter 6 for just a moment. In verse 59, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum, John 6, 59. Now he said some words. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said this is a hard saying. And it's the word word, logos. This is a hard saying. This is a harsh saying. This is unsympathetic to humanity is what that means. This is a disagreeable saying. We don't like this saying. Who can hear it? Who can be expected to listen to such things? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, his word, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What I've said. Does this offend you? Are you offended by these words? Verse 62, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Now, I love this. He's saying, if you're offended now, you'll really be offended then. When you see who I really am in my awesome majesty and glory, speaking with the power that shakes the earth, that created the earth, you'll really be offended then. Verse 63, it is the Spirit that quickeneth that gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you that you find harsh and disagreeable and say, who can hear these things? They are spirit and they are life. But, there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. We're done with this disciple stuff. We've had it with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve as he watched the multitudes leave. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? It's not like we have an option. Do you have any options? Do you have anywhere else to go? We don't have any other options. To whom shall we go? The law? That won't do us any good. Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ the Son of the living God. Now the Lord is so identified with His words that He calls Himself, what? The Word. The Word. The Word of God. Now we believe them, we keep them, we guard over them. We don't want anything that He says to fall to the ground. Now look what it said next in John chapter 14, 22. If a man love me, he will keep my words and my Father will love him. And we, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit will come unto him and make our abode with him. We're going to dwell with that person. That person is going to be our habitation. If I'm somebody who loves his word, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit have made me their dwelling place, their abode. What glory. Now, he's manifested himself to you When you hear his word, you love his word, and you love him. 
And you know what? I hear His Word. I love His Word. And I love His person. Verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Now if you can let one word of His, if you can do without it, you don't love Him. Every word He says is precious, pure. The very Word of God. If you can let one doctrine go, well, I think that one's not essential. I can let that one go out the window. That one's not that important. It's pretty important, but it's not. You don't love Him. You can't love Him and let His Word go. Now that's what He's saying. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. He doesn't dart over them or hold on to it. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which has sent me. These are the very words of God. That's why they're so important. These are not things I've made. These are the words of Him that sent me. Now these things, verse 25, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us? Well, you're going to hear the word and you're going to keep it. And you're not going to let it go. Because you love my person. And I gave you that love. That's how he begins. How he manifests himself. Now, look in verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father hath will, will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Now how is it he manifests himself to us and not to the world? The Holy Spirit. He gives us God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit gives us life. That's where that love to him comes from. That's where hearing his word comes from. That's where a refusal to let his word uh, go comes from. We have the Spirit of God. Only the us has the Spirit of God. Look in uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. <coughs> and John <coughs> verse 32 and John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. John 1, 32 and 33, or verse 33, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water saith unto me, Unto whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Look in John chapter 3. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, lacks the ability. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. It will never rise above that. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wills, speaking of the sovereignty of the Spirit. You hear the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Look in John chapter 7, verse 37. And that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Look in John 14. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, 
because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Verses 25 and 26 of the same chapter, these things that I've spoken to you, I bet, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. Look in John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I'll send him unto you, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Well, that is so thrilling to me as a preacher. Um, he's the one that does the guide, not me. I don't have to worry about this thing. It's him that does it. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he'll show you things to come. He shall glorify me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. The reason you love him, the reason you love his words, the reason you are unwilling to let any of his words get away, you keep them, is because you've been born of the Spirit, taught of the Spirit, guided by the Spirit. He doesn't do this for the world. The world can't receive him. Only those the Father gives him to. How is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Well, by giving you my words, causing you to love them, giving you my spirit. And back to John 14, what he says in verse 27. How is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? Verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid. Now no one that's of the world has any peace. He may say he does. She may say she, I have peace. You do not. If you believe in salvation by works in any way to any degree, peace is impossible. You will always be thinking, have I left something out? Have I done enough? The attention will always be directed to you and your doing. And you'll never really have any peace. So I've, I've heard people say, I've got peace and I... Uh, you know, I don't want to be rude sometimes. I always say, you do not. I know better than that. Um, but the Lord gives peace. You know that passage of Scripture where it says the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your mind and heart through Christ Jesus? Well, um, that word passes. It doesn't mean it's just beyond comprehension. We just don't understand it. We just... Feel it. It just means the peace of God excels and goes beyond all understanding. It's a glorious peace. The peace that I give. You see, the peace he gives is caused by the peace he accomplished. Having made peace, Colossians 1.20, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification, therefore being justified. Having been justified. It's 
God that justifieth. Who is he that condemn? It's God that justifieth. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God justified him. Now, don't forget this. If I'm justified, that means I don't have any sin. That means I never committed sin. That means I stand before the holy law of God having never sinned, but keeping the law perfectly. Now, that's the only thing I get peace from. But what a peace there is. My peace I give unto you. And you know, this peace that the believers enjoy, it makes us be at peace with one another. You see, Christ is all. You really don't have anything I want to fight you over. I've already got everything. To you, Christ is all. I don't really have anything you want that you want to fight me over. I mean, peace. Peace between brethren. The peace that's caused by Him being our peace. I'm at peace with providence. Does that mean I always have a good attitude? No, no. I'll have just as bad an attitude as you do. Boy, things aren't going well. But, but all that being said is I have peace knowing that he doeth all things well and that everything is working together for my good and his glory, that he's the first cause of everything. Have peace. And those people who don't have peace with God, I want them to have peace with God. I want to tell them how peace with God has been accomplished by Christ Jesus the Lord. But what is the difference? How is it that he'll manifest himself to us and not to the world? This thing of peace. The peace of justification. He said, my peace. Think of the peace Christ has with the Father. Now, I know we can't really enter into this, but he's never felt guilt before God, except when he was on the cross bearing the shame of his people. And that's been put away, but he's never felt guilt. He's, he's felt perfect communion. He's felt perfect everything. That's the peace that no unbeliever has any idea about. It's the peace of what Christ accomplished in my behalf. Verse 28, you've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again to you. Well, if you love me, you'd rejoice. Because I said I go unto my Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now, you've heard me say, I'm leaving. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if you love me, you'd rejoice. He's going back to the Father. He's going back to the Father. He's been here for 33 years as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. That stuff's over. He's going back to the Father in perfect communion. Perfect, oh, the, the bond between the Father and the Son. And He's going back with something. He's presenting His righteousness to the Father in behalf of all those He died for. Of judgment, of righteousness, because I go to the Father and I bring my righteousness. He will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, but of righteousness because I go to the Father. And I'm coming back again too. Now here's something to rejoice in. I love that scripture. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But, when we, know, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Now you've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again to you. If you love me, you'd rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. He's going back to him with his own righteousness he even says, for my Father is greater than I. Somebody says, what in the world does that mean? Well, I know exactly what it means. He's equal to the Father, and he's subordinate to the Father. It's that simple. He's equal to the Father. He's not any, in any way inferior to the Father. But he subordinates himself as the Father's servant. And everything he did while he was on this planet was an act of submission, <laughs> subordination to his Father. My Father is greater than I. And now I've told you, verse 29, and now I've told you before it came to pass that when it come to pass, you might believe. I've told you what's going to take place and you're going to believe. You're going to, 
When it comes to pass, when uh, I, I'm going to finish the work. And we hear him say, it is finished. And we believe. It's finished. It's finished. We believe. He, he tells us what's going to happen. We believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. He can't find anything he can hold on to. But that the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. And that's when he begins John chapter 15 about I'm the true vine. And I, I, I don't know if this took place, but they get up and start walking, and he looks at a vineyard. And he says, I'm the true vine. And he goes on from there. But what a question. How is it that thou manifest thyself to us and not the world? And what a glorious answer. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the manifestation of your person. Lord, we would be just as the world is had you not chosen us out of the world. And Lord, we stand amazed when we hear you say that we are not of the world even as you are not of the world. Lord, we were so amazed at the greatness of your grace and we give thanks. Lord, we once again would remember Jennifer. We pray for your hand to be upon the doctors and that it would be your will that you would heal her of this. For the Lord's sake, according to your will, give her grace. Be with all your people wherever they meet together. And bless us in this coming week. Bless us during this time. May we be found in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Dwayne, could you leave us in closing hymn?